Codex? Um, she's the one um, way up. Okay, see the guy in the red shirt right there? Uh-huh. She's behind him. Behind yeah, the red shirt? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> you saw? Okay. Okay. So, well, I'm glad you're all here. That's great. You must have enjoyed the midterm, right? No? No? Really? The worst is over. The best is yet to come, right, Karen? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Anybody got any thoughts about this midterm? I didn't sleep for two days. You didn't sleep for two days. Oh, that's pretty good. Oh. When you're writing about socialism, you won't need to sleep at all. Yes. Chelsea? I think you should have people, you should select ones to perform for the first essay. Ah, yes, performances. That's a good idea. I even heard that somebody was going to put it on YouTube. <laughs> Conrad? Well, I mean, it wasn't supposed to get out, but yeah, we were going to do it with something, something, and yeah. have a dialogue and script, script and whatever. Well, we could still do that. Yeah, we will. We could still do that. Perhaps the GSIs will find some actable. Hmm? Yeah, we can do that. That's that. That if we succeed by next... Yeah, the end of next semester, we get A's on the final. Oh, yes. No, if you stage a revolution, there'll be no A's. Everybody, uh, grades will disappear, right? Ah, uh, yes. Jason. I think the word count was a little unreasonable, except especially for uh, Word count was unreasonable. You mean there was, you were given too many words? Too little. Yeah, I know. That's the point. I mean, you know, my view is if you really understand things, then you can say them concisely. I know. It's di- that's the difficult part of these papers. It's easy to write 20 pages on the rise and fall of capitalism. Chelsea. I have to say, though, on that point, that for the first essay also, like... You, I found myself having to choose between being imaginative and being concise about uh-huh. contextualizing them and like knowing that I was making a sacrifice for one or the other and not wanting to. You can't be concise and imaginative. There's something wrong there. You're making a transcript. Aha. Uh, okay, well, you can do it again. Give me a longer version. Give it just to me, or we can perform it, the longer version. YouTube doesn't go, shouldn't go longer than a minute and a half, though, right? Two minutes each. Two minutes. <laughs> two minutes each, right. Okay. Good. Okay, yes. I, and it's difficult. I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult. But concision and imagination should not be opposed. They're not in contradiction. Any other thoughts uh, about this? Jessica, you, you see me bursting at the seams here. No? <laughs> Hi. Now you're sitting up from your chair as if you want to say something. Hmm? <laughs> what? What have I done? No, no, she no, is my realm of freedom. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> the question is this. The question is this. Will Jessica return to the realm of necessity? <laughs> Oh, life is tough. Okay, yes. I tell you, under communism, that will be taken care of. Each seat will have deliverables. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. So, we are... Sorry, excuse me, Jane. Okay, very good. All right, so... Um, so, we're at the middle of the semester, a bit beyond the middle of the semester. And, um, uh, yes. So, that means that we will begin talking about Lenin on Thursday. I think I'll show you a film. It's not the most spectacular of films, but it'll give you some idea of the life of Lenin. And we'll discuss that film on Thursday. And then on next Tuesday, we'll start with Lenin. And you'll see that Lenin is specifically timed to coincide with the elections. And you'll see that Lenin has all sorts of things to say about elections, particularly in a society like this one. Uh, so I think it's particularly relevant. And then when the election is over, we will turn to Gramsci, particularly relevant for post-election politics. And uh, finally, we will turn to Fanon. And we'll do that by the end of the semester. So what we are going to be doing in fact, is in fact engaging with the writings of Marx and Engels through these different perspectives. Right, so, um, yeah. You know what they've been saying about Obama? They've been saying he's a socialist, right, Elizabeth? Yes! Well, I mean, i got some quotes for you. That's interesting. <laughs> Obama is a, a socialist. It's, it's not quite direct, but listen to this, because this is the best we can do. You see, you see, Obama believes in redistributing wealth, not in policies that help us make more of it. Joe, you know who Joe is, right? <laughs> Wurzelbacher. Joe, in his plain-spoken way, said, this sounded a lot like socialism, McCain said Saturday. 
All right. That was, he's not saying it directly, but he's saying that Joe said it. Indeed, Joe Wurzelbacher did say it. In an interview with ABC last week, you would think he was becoming a candidate for president, actually, Wurzelbacher. In an interview with ABC last week, Wurzelbacher said Obama's proposal to raise taxes by 3% on those making 250000 and over is a, quote, very socialist review. View, sorry, not review. View. And then McCain also said in his radio address, quote, at least in Europe, the socialist leaders who so admire my opponent are upfront about their objectives. They use real numbers and honest language, and we should demand equal candor from Senator Obama. Raising taxes on some in order to give checks to others is not a tax cut, it's just another government giveaway. And McCain said also, spread the wealth around. We have seen that movie before in other countries and attempts by the liberal left before, McCain said. All right. Obama is socialist. What do you think? Obama is socialist. Is there anything socialist about Obama? Are we voting for a, or not voting, or one of the candidates? Socialist. Any views about this? No, we just may have some view about this. <laughs> <laughs> last? Uh, no, that's last, right? Compared to Norwegian standards, he's like... Compared to Norwegian standards, I'm just repeating this so you can all hear this. Compared to Norwegian standards, he's just like... Conservative? A conservative. Uh-huh. Sienna? Well, I'm sorry, I think he's I can't hear you. I said, as far as I'm concerned, I feel like you can always build nice dollars of socialism right now. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But that's, that's avoiding the question. <laughs> that's a serious question. It's an interesting, Jason. He did support the bailout for massive redistribution of wealth. So that's, you know, and actually, actually, he did support the bailout, and actually Obama actually says somewhere, in a very wonderful passage he says, he says, John McCain is so out of touch with the struggles you are facing that he must be the first politician in history to call a tax cut for working people welfare. Obama told a massive crowd under the famous St. Louis, St. Louis Arch, St. Louis Arch, the only welfare in this campaign is John McCain's plan to give another 200 billion in tax cuts to the wealthiest corporations in America. That's Jason's view. Socialism, I remember you brought that up long ago. Socialism for the wealthy, right? Yes, 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 yes. But Anyway, you've been doing 14, what is it, six, seven weeks of what? Marxism. Now, according to the notions of Marx and Engels, do any either of these candidates represent a socialist view? No. And if they don't represent a socialist view, why is this word being used? Sure. Hands up, Jenny. Ideology. Uh-huh. Ideology. Through that lens, we can, like, attach values to different candidates when they may not be there. Uh-huh. So what's, 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 what's going on here? Obama's a moderate. Uh-huh. He's, um, you know, he's going to, he's going to uh huh. Uh huh. A moderate that ignores the bigger picture, Josephine. Um, yeah, I was talking to you about the Uh huh. So what? So what's going on there? All right. So socialism has been used as a fear tactic, but why is it a fear tactic, Casey? Well, because it's these are four-letter words since the Cold War. Uh huh. <laughs> so it's considered a four-letter word since it is considered, you know, somebody who calls themselves a socialist publicly. Is what? Are, what are the connotations to you? That's an interesting question. When you call somebody a socialist in the United States of America, in the way that McCain or What's all back? What is what is the what are the implications? What are the implications of this? Authoritarian, no democracy. Authoritarian, no democracy. So it's associated with communist regime, Soviet regime, yes, Katie? It's associated with fascism. Associated with fascism, yeah. is that right? Where the government takes everything that everyone earns uh-huh. and distributes. Uh-huh. 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 Uh, fascism, authoritarianism, we're going from bad to worse. Yes, Neil? Uh, jealousy over those who have more than you do. So if you call somebody a socialist, it implies they're jealous of those who have, like, acquired wealth. Ah, if you call somebody a socialist, it's they're, they're, they're basically resentful for those who become wealthy because they have the presumption is that people gain wealth through their own dedication. So it's a matter of, it's, a, it's, also, it's, 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 it's somebody who does not believe in the American dream ideology. Aha, uh-huh, aha, uh-huh. interesting. Any other thoughts about what socialism may mean? Yes, Chelsea? Like in a ground level way for people, it has it comes down to an argument about will. Like when you're speaking about the market, or I've been having a conversation with a relative who thinks who had talked about this exact thing with me, and it really surprised me. But his whole thing was that we were going to have rights taken away from us because it's so been embedded that like there's a free market and there's a regulated market. Even if Obama is just trying to pull back the reins on capitalism a little bit, to them it looks like trying to close off and actually, you know, like the way that. So what is lost is then freedom, freedom, freedom of choice. Yes, 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 Alex, speak up. <laughs> Alex is asking for help because there's nowhere else in the world where socialism is a quote dirty word. Well, there may be other places. 
fact, an interesting, you know, and sometimes actually it is in so-called socialist countries that the word socialism becomes a dirty word. Actually, you know, even in the uh, Soviet Union for some it became a dirty word. But anyway, anybody going to help uh, poor Alex here understand this American so-called U.S. phenomenon? Yes, Juliana. Well, before you go off what Chelsea was saying a little bit more, I think, like, using that dirty word is to cloud the So what? So who, who is making the same error? Who is making the same error, you might say, as shall we say McCain? Those who castigate redistribution of socialism. They want to endorse, as you're saying, competitive capitalism. The only alternative to competitive capitalism is what? Socialism. socialism. Who said that? Who said that? Marx! Marx. Yes, indeed! McCain equals Marx. <laughs> they both believe that the only viable form of capitalism is unregulated competitive capitalism. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> there is a difference between them. <laughs> but nonetheless, Marx does believe in an alternative to capitalism, and which is of a character, as you know, communism, which is profoundly different to organized, organized capitalism. Because that's a very interesting convergence. A very interesting convergence. Thank you, Julian. Anyway, we've, I'm sure there will be all sorts of other interesting things to say, but socialism is indeed, we haven't helped you out, I'm sure, Alex, but socialism is indeed bandied around as a critical, as a, if you wish, a dirty word, but it's certainly a, to be called somebody a socialist is a derogatory uh, a way of, a, of addressing someone. And, of course, part of it, as I think somebody said, is a legacy of the Cold War in which you know, the United States and the Soviet Union were seen at loggerheads and they represented two fundamentally different ideological systems, the one communist socialist, the other capitalist. So there is a legacy of that. Yeah. Yes. And also there's the absence of any socialist movement in the last few decades in this country. It has been obliterated, so people have no imagination of what it might mean here. However, if Engels is right, if Engels is right, and we are entering into a deeper crisis, then the state may nonetheless have to do what? Well, not necessarily seize power, but at least begin to regulate the economy and to introduce what would be referred to as socialist uh, characteristics. And indeed, you know, read the newspaper every day, you hear more and more about precisely what Engels is talking about in 710, 711, namely the concentration of capital, namely the regulation of relations among capitalists by the state. But what still is systematically absent is what? The emergence of some sort of struggle, some sort of social movement. It's still systematically absent. Interesting. Okay. All right. Anyway, I just, I cannot, for me, I am in disbelief that the, this country is, and the world indeed is following so closely the, the, the course of this course. Um, and we will see, we'll continue to do so for the rest of the semester and no doubt beyond. But we are going to move on. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about actually socialism between 1890 and 1920. And I'm going to give you an idea of what the debates were. But first I want to summarize. First I want to summarize very quickly. I want to summarize. We had two pictures last time. Two pictures last time. The static picture of Marxist theory with the economic base, the mode of production, the forces and relations of production. And then we had the superstructure, variously containing political apparatuses and political institutions, ideological institutions, parts of the state, supporting and re and reproducing and maintaining this economic base of capitalism. And then we have this interesting thing over here called consciousness. And we're particularly interested in the consciousness of the working class, though we should also be interested in the consciousness of the capitalist class, to what extent the capitalists understand capitalism, and to what extent they can only follow their nose and drive capitalism to its death. Anyway, we're talking about the working class consciousness. We see on the one hand, Marx is saying that the consciousness of the working class is shaped by their position in production, that they are workers, atomized, but nevertheless through struggle form themselves into a class. But on the other hand, countervailing force, an ideology from above, when Marx talks about the ideas of the dominant class or the ruling ideas in society, the idea that dominant ideologies provide the terrain of struggle, that we in this country, for example, struggle on the terrain of individualism, of rights, of individuals, of private property. These are the ideologies upon which we engage in struggle. And so this may undermine the development of a class consciousness. And so Marx is saying...